This is, I think, why people are so obsessed in some sense with the search for fundamental meaning. This is a good story. So you can imagine two people laying bricks, they're building a gigantic wall, and the one person thinks, oh my God, you know, this wall is gonna take 100,000 bricks. I'm laying one at a time and I'm wasting my life away, trivially adding to this gigantic brick wall. And what am I doing? This is absolutely miserable, brick by brick. And the other person thinks, in 300 years, this is gonna be a cathedral. And so the person in the second state is doing exactly the same thing at a local level, laying bricks, but each brick is related to a very high goal. And that means the reward that's attendant upon the laying of the brick is proportional to the goal of the entire behavioral process. So if you're aimless and, and goalless, then you can't elicit any positive emotion. And if your goals are fragmented, which is also what happens if you're aimless or your goals lack unity, if your goals are fragmented, then no given behavioral manifestation can elicit any dopaminergic reward because it's not a step forward to anything desirable. One of the things, well, I did write about this in my first book, particularly about putting your life, putting your house in perfect order. It's like, well, if, you, if you're lost, one of the things you can do is look around and see what direction you could take locally. Fix something. Find something that you could do that would make things better that you would do. And there's a humility in that too, because especially if you're in a low energy state, it's like, oh my God, you know, I don't have enough energy to make dinner. It's like, do you have enough energy to put a fork on the table? And sometimes people are so depressed that that's really all they can do. Can you take a small step forward, no matter how small that is? Implement a micro routine, even something like washing a cup and putting it back in the shelf. And you know that's a good thing because you have a shelf and there's cups on it. You've already decided that's an appropriate way to live is to have your coffee cups on a shelf. If you go ahead with cleaning out the cup and putting it on the shelf, then you've taken steps towards a, a valuable micro goal. You get a dopamine kick from that. That transforms itself into adrenaline and energizes you. But in part, what the dopamine system is doing. So imagine that the purpose of the dopamine system is to elicit a satiating reward, fundamentally. But then the satiating reward is something that has to be approached in, in steps. And so in order to maintain the motivation necessary to approach the satiating reward, you have to mark each of the steps with a, with a marker of pleasure. Small things are not small. You might have the cognitive appraisal that doing something local, like cleaning up your room, is small, but it's not obvious at all that that's the case. It's not, it's not that trivial to put your immediate surroundings in order, and it can easily be the stepping stone to putting things in order on a broader scale. In fact, it's probably the necessary stepping stone to do that. You can pat yourself on the back, especially if you're depressed a little harder than you might otherwise, by saying, you know, you say, well, this is trivial, but I did it. It's like, no, if you're moving ahead, that's not small. You just keep doing that, you're gonna get out of this paralyzed or retreat mode. If you're in the zone of proximal development, you're pushing your skill development one increment forward. And it's one that you can actually manage. Imagine that you have someone who's habitually avoidant. And maybe they're avoidant because when they become possessed by negative emotion, they become hyper aware of their internal state and they feel the panic. And so then they freeze or retreat. And they do that constantly. And then they're in this terrible negative emotional state all the time because every time they see a stimulus that's associated with retreat, they get gripped by these interoceptive sensations. And so you say to them, well, we're gonna reverse that. Instead of you being gripped by that, you're going to expose yourself to that voluntarily. See, if you do that repeatedly with people, not only do they stop being afraid of the things that you're that you're showing them, that you're exposing them to. But they become more likely to approach other things they're afraid of, far more likely. In fact, it doesn't exactly look like people get more less afraid at all. It looks like what happens is they learn to get braver. One of the phenomenon, cognitive phenomena, that loads very heavily on neuroticism is self-consciousness. And so when you fall into anxiety, then there is this internal obsessiveness, which has to do with 
the panoply of sins in some sense. Which parts of me are malfunctioning and need to be eradicated? And one of the things I used to do with my socially anxious clients, so they would go into a social situation, often with eyes downcast, by the way, and they would be so intensely concentrating on their own internal sensations that they would fail to make eye contact with anybody they were talking to. And then they would be awkward because they weren't reading the cues they could have read if they would have only looked. And then the conversation would become disjointed and then they would get anxious and fall into themselves. And so one of the things that I taught them to do wasn't to try to calm themselves down, but to try to calm the other person down. So when you go into a social situation, pay more attention to the other person. Like just focus your attention outward. And if the person had any social skill, sometimes I had clients who had no social skills. And so they were anxious socially because they actually didn't know how to behave socially. So then you had to teach them the social skills. But some of them had the skills but wouldn't activate them because they were so neurotically obsessed with their own inadequacy that they failed to attend to the cues that would elicit the proper responses. And all they had to learn to do was watch. And then they would automatically respond because they knew how to have a conversation. See, the reason that socially anxious people are so interoceptive is it's involuntary, right? They get gripped by the negative emotion and then that produces this intense, obsessive interoception. That might not happen if they did it voluntarily. This is why exposure therapy works so well in, in psychotherapy is like, well, I'm afraid of something and if I go near it, then I'm possessed by negative emotion. Well, that's if you go near it accidentally. I'm gonna have you go near it purposefully. And what you're gonna find is that to the degree that you do it purposefully, that response will be quelled. And that happens, it's extraordinarily reliable. Imagine you anticipate something and then you make a mistake. Now the question then becomes, how significant is the mistake? The depressive takes that punishment response, let's say that's a consequence of failed anticipation and can't bind it. It just, it just takes out all of their potential future selves. And so then they're in a depressive pit. That's too much learning from failure. That binding problem is really tricky. One of the rules of thumb for that that's extremely use useful, that's socially instantiated, is innocent until proven guilty. So you might say, when those thoughts come up, because they're adversarial and accusatory thoughts, you might say, well, that is part of the realm of possibility. But when your child does something wrong that's minor, you don't say you're a rotten kid. You bind it. You say, look, kid, here's a bunch of things you're doing right. But in this particular example, specific situation, here's the minimal thing you did incorrectly and how to alter it. And it's a really good habit of mind to address towards yourself as well as to other people, which is to say, well, what's the minimum crime that I'm responsible for in this moment? And that's part of this miracle of the presumption of innocence and especially without proof. A lot of what I did in my clinical practice to people who had a depressive temperament was help them make a case for themselves. It's like, well, maybe you're as bad as you think you might be, but maybe not. Let's take the contrary argument and only narrow the repair to the absolute minimum that needs to be manifested. Sometimes when you make one little mistake, it is actually an indicator of a flaw in your character, but most of the time it isn't. And it certainly can't be responded to that all the time because then you'd never be able to make a mistake without wiping yourself completely out. You want to make it as local and precise as you possibly can. And that's also one of the advantages to removing yourself from a rage or an anxiety state because a rage or an anxiety state is low resolution and global. And so it'll be globally accusatory. So you want to specify it and you think, okay, well, what's the, what's the minimum necessary behavioral transformation to ensure that similar mistakes are not replicated in the future? It's like if your roof leaks, you don't have to dig a new foundation. You can just fix a few shingles. And you might think, well, the rain's coming through, so you have to tear down the whole house. It's like, well, no. 
And you might panic and run around because the water's coming in, but it's still a bad idea to dig up the foundations every time something trivial maintenance problem needs to emerge. And so one of the things that's very useful to learn is like, well, is this only a trivial maintenance problem? And one of the advantages to that too is that if it's not the collapse of your entire self, let's say, and it's a trivial maintenance problem, you're much more able to activate that, that courageous response to anomaly that's part and parcel of exploratory behavior and eventual success. So when part of the trick of, of, of many sorts of, well, I would say religious training enterprises, certainly the meditative enterprises, is something like, how do you tell yourself a story, like a real story, though a, a story that actually works, where you can confidently approach the thing that's blocking your path?